Well, hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I'm your host, Dr. B, and today we're going to be talking about process costing. And before we jump into our conversation on process costing, I just want to quickly recap where we are in the classroom here in the spring 2022 semester. Uh, so in the classroom homepage, as you're coming down, we uh, made it. <laughs> we made it into module two. Uh, this is week five of, of a 16-week semester. So we are in module two, week five. So module two, week five. So new module, right? Um, just as we have with the previous weeks, we have the PowerPoint presentation exercises, which is just for practice to help you to better understand the content and our um, weekly assignment. In this case, it's the uh, chapter 20 quiz. So just as before with all quizzes and homework assignments, you have the opportunity to take that up to two times. So if you're not satisfied with a grade uh, that you received on a previous homework assignment or quiz, please feel free to take that again. Um, take your time with it. Remember, they're, they're always open book, open note, all of that good stuff. Uh, and take your time. You know, it's, it's important that we, that we get the practice in. Right. As I said in pre uh, previous uh, classes, accounting is a practice. So the more that we practice, you know, going through the exercises in the book, going through the exercises that I provided to you as well, the more that we do those kind of things, the better we get at accounting. And so that's why it's so important that we that we try our best to to really practice uh, and then go ahead and take the homework assignment and quiz. Again, if you're not satisfied with your grade on a homework assignment or a quiz, whether it be uh, the one from last week or the or the one from week two or whatever, please feel free to go ahead and retake that. Uh, each homework assignment, each quiz can be taken up to two times. The highest of the two grades will be taken into the grade book. And of course, if you ever have any comments, questions, or concerns about a question or about um, you know some of the content. You can always set up office hours. Uh, you can call me, email me, set up office hours, all that good stuff. And then, of course, we also have our uh, tutoring available. So if, you, if you're having trouble in the course and you're really not understanding stuff and, you know, you can't make it to office hours, you can't, you know, find the time to email me, you can always set up time with our tutors as well. So just things to think about um, as, as we move forward. But, of course... You know, think of me as your primary resource. So having said that, let's go ahead and jump into today's lecture on process costing. And I want to uh, preface process costing. Last week, we talked about this thing called job costing. In job costing, we are identifying the cost associated with completing each customer order or a job, okay? A, a job is a specific customer order. That's a job, okay? And I'm tracking costs like direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, and I'm applying that those costs to each job. That's what job order costing is, okay? And I use the job order cost sheet to track those costs for each job, okay? That's job order costing. We talked a lot about that last week. Now it's time to talk a little bit more about process costing. Remember, job order costing, we focus on individual customer orders, whereas process costing, we're looking at it from a continuous manufacturing process. We're processing things like chicken, beef, milk. We process those things. We're continuously working on that product, and then we're shipping it out, shipping it out, shipping it out. And we do that regardless of customer order. We continuously have a flow 
of products going to grocery stores, regardless of customer orders. Nike continuously manufactures shoes continuously, regardless of customer orders, because Nike knows they're going to keep selling through. Okay, the, Nike doesn't manufacture sneakers based on a single customer order. No, no, no. We're going to keep making them because we know we're going to keep selling them. So regardless of customer order, I'm going to fill that warehouse and I'm going to keep pumping it out. That's process costing. And the example I'm going to use throughout this uh, discussion are tennis balls. A ten, you know, ten, you don't know what tennis balls are. They're the little green balls that they hit back and forth with the rackets. Yeah, the tennis. So, tennis balls are continuously manufactured, regardless of the customer orders. We'll fill a whole warehouse full of them. Why? Because we know we're going to keep selling them, and we're going to sell them to everyone. Not just based off of customer orders, right? So it's a continuous process. Ice cream, milk, uh, produce. Um, those are all, uh, you know, chicken, beef, uh, vegetables. That's all continuous. That's We call that process costing. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like as, as we move through each department in the work in process all the way to finished goods and then it gets into the warehouse. It, but it's a continuous flow. So as we're talking about process costing, think continuous flow. And so I'll, I'll show you the difference between job order, process costing a little bit further. We'll talk about the advantages of each. We'll discuss uh, how we value the inventory for both job order costing, uh, process costing, the differences between the two. Uh, and we will also discuss the flow of materials, direct labor, factory overhead through process costing. So first, let's take a look at operations, business operations, okay? In job order operations, we manufacture in bulk, uh, the products are a little bit more diversified, they are uh, sold in batches to customers, they're based off customer orders, etc. That's job process operations. In process costing operations, we manufacture the same exact product over and over and over again. Think of like uh, an ice cream manufacturer. Think of your favorite ice cream. Let's say it's Ben and Jerry's or it's, uh, uh, it's whatever, you know, whatever your favorite is, okay? And you, you'll go to the grocery store and you'll say, oh, I want my Ben and Jerry's ice cream. You know, I want my pint. And you'll go to the frozen section and you'll see a ton of Ben and Jerry's, right? And it's a lot of the same stuff. It's like a lot of, and a lot of it, right? It's an identical product. They make that continuously on a conveyor belt. Yeah? Conveyor belt system and the machines do a lot of different stuff. And then there's the packaging and all that jazz, right? It's automated. It's continuous. That's process costing. Or you go to the grocery store and, and you uh, you get my favorite chicken from Tyson's, okay? And you go you go down the uh, the aisle where the chicken is and you see Tyson's chicken and you're like, oh, that's really good. And you see a whole lot of bags of it, right? And it's the same way at all the grocery stores. That's continuous processing. They're continuously processing the chickens. Uh, and they're, they're forming them, the meat, putting it into bags and shipping it off. It's a continuous automated process, and each product that they make is identical. So it keeps the cost low, and it keeps it continuously moving. The thing with process costing, though, is that the cost cannot be directly traced 
to each unit. It's, it's almost impossible, right? If, if I'm making hundreds of thousands of the same exact product over and over and over again each day, it's difficult for me to be able to say, oh, you know, my costs for this day were, and then trace it to each product. <laughs> Very difficult to do. So we, we track direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead as the product moves through the process. Think of like, the, so as we go through this discussion, think of like a, a conveyor belt, okay? And on that conveyor belt, you see the same exact thing, you know, one after another, one after another, you know? Um, since we're getting closer to Valentine's Day, think of like chocolate, okay? That's a continuous process. Um, you know, think of like your favorite chocolate, like your, your Hershey's Kisses or your M&M's or, you know, whatever, whatever your sweet tooth likes. And think about what that looks like as it's moving through the factory, okay? It starts off as sugar. It starts off as cocoa. It starts off as... Um, liquid uh, candy coating, okay? That's how it starts. And then it goes into a mixing bowl. And in the mixing bowl, you, we're combining the sugar and the uh, cocoa and the whatever else. And then from the mixing bowl, it, it goes through like a funnel, and it gets dabbed onto a conveyor belt from a machine, yeah? And then it moves down the conveyor belt. And then it gets to like um, an oven or whatever. And then there's a coating process. And then after that, it gets packaged. You know, it gets wrapped. And then it goes into a box or into a bag. And then the box goes into a, a bag, goes into a box. And the box gets shipped off to the warehouse. And then from the warehouse, it goes to the distributor. And the distributor brings it to the various grocery stores. That's how it works. But things don't just magically appear at the grocery store, right? It has to go through a process. So since we're close to Valentine's Day, think about your, your favorite chocolate. Think about what, what it goes through when it's going through the manufacturing process. It starts off as raw ingredients. You know, your sugar, your um, uh, cocoa, your whatever's. And then it goes from raw ingredients, it gets mixed up in a giant mixing bowl. It goes through a process. And then it goes to the next department. The next department is the, um, the funnel. Then the next department is the conveyor belt. The next department goes down the conveyor belt. We get to the ovens. And then the next department goes to, you know, the coating. And then it gets to the packaging and all that jazz. It's a continuous flow. It's not like we're just doing batches of Hershey's Kisses, we're doing tons of them. We're doing millions, not just a couple of little bits. That that um, factory line, that production line, that's running 24-7, 365, with a few humans involved. It is automated. So if you ever get a chance and you're ever curious to see how something like chocolate's made, Take a short up trip up to Pennsylvania, to Hershey, Pennsylvania, and go go through the factory uh, on a tour to uh, at the Hershey factory, and they'll show you how things are made. And it's it's just as I just described. It, there's a conveyor belt, a lot of machines, and it it's just continuous. Yeah. So that's what I want you to think about as we're as we're going through all this, talking about. Con the process, process, cost. At each process, I'm adding a little bit more direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead as it's moving toward a completed unit. So at each department along that conveyor belt, in each department along that conveyor belt, I'm adding some more direct material, direct labor, factory overhead. Direct material, direct labor, factory over it. Plus, direct material, direct labor, factory over it. For each department, as it's moving through the process. 
then when it reaches finished goods, it gets, you know, after it's packaged and then sitting in the warehouse, that's when I can sell it. That's when it's ready to be sold. But I'm going to fill that warehouse up because I'm going to keep selling those Hershey Kisses regardless, right? That's the process. That's the operations of it. So last week, we talked about job costing. And the example we gave was an automobile manufacturer, a car manufacturer. And each car manufactured was a job. Somebody ordered that car to be manufactured. Okay, somebody said, oh, I want, I want it... I want this model, I want it in blue, I want it uh, to have this trim level. Um, that's a job, yeah? It's specific to a customer's order. That's a job. So I took my direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, I applied it to each job on a job order cost sheet. I went through the assembly line, work in process, and then at the end I added up all the labor I used, all of the materials I used, all the overhead I used, applied it to that individual job, became finished good, and then I sold it. Yep, that was job order costing. The job is the individual customer order. So think cars, right? Customer places an order for a car. It goes through the manufacturing process. The customer receives the car at the end of the day, right? That customer's order is very specific. Yeah, that's job order costing. Process costing is continuous regardless of customer order. The customer can order or not order it. I don't care. I'm going to keep manufacturing a product. And the example I'm going to use is tennis balls. You go to um, a sporting goods store. You go to, heck, I think they even sell some of those tennis balls at grocery stores every so often. Uh, or you go to, um, uh, you, you go to, you go to uh, Ross or you go to uh, TJ Maxx or whatever, right? And you see a sleeve of tennis balls. Okay, in the sporting goods area, whatever. Or near the pets. You, you go to uh, a place like uh, uh, Petco, right? And you say, oh, there's a bunch of tennis balls. Yeah, dogs like tennis balls. So the manufacturing of those tennis balls is continuous. It's regardless of customer order. They're going to just keep making them. Okay, because they know they're going to sell. Right? So... In the process costing system, since it's continuous, I'm applying direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead in work in process. The difference in work in process is instead of it just being one stage, like it is in job order costing, it, within work in process, I have multiple departments of work in process. It, remember the conveyor belt, okay? The tennis ball starts as some raw rubber, okay? I don't know how rubber's made, so I'm just going to assume that there's some glue involved. But let's, let's say it's, it, the, the raw materials is rubber and felt. Felt is what is around on the outside of the tennis ball, yeah? So we have rubber, we have felt, we have um, a core. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making things up. Those are my direct materials. The core is the rubber. I got the felt, all that jazz. It goes through the conveyor belt. It starts as raw rubber. And I have some employees that are forming the rubber into a, a ball shape. And I have a little factory overhead in that first department. The first department of work in process is 
We call it the core department, twerking process. It's where we start making the core of the tennis ball. So I add my rubber, I got my employees, a little factory overhead in that first department. Then the tennis balls move down the assembly to the conveyor belt. Yeah. And then it gets to the next department. And then that next department is called the felt department. That's where my employees are cutting the sheets of felt and they're wrapping it around the tennis balls, the, the core, right? They're wrapping it around the core. So I'm in that second department, the felt department, I'm adding more direct materials, more direct labor, more factory overhead. I'm adding those costs to what has already happened in the core department. So the core department's where we start off, right? I got direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. The tennis ball moves down the conveyor belt to the felt department. Now I'm adding more direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead to that same tennis ball. So let's say I in the first department I added uh, 10 cents for uh, the rubber, another 20 cents for labor, and another 10 cents for factory overhead. Okay, so I'm up to 40 cents. Then it moves down to work to um, the felt department. In the felt department, I'm adding another 20 cents of materials, another 10 cents of labor, and another 10 cents of overhead. So now I'm up to 80 cents or something like that, right? And next, and next, after the felt is on, the tennis ball is moving down the conveyor belt. Okay? Now it's making it to the packaging department. And in the packaging department, my machine and my employees are putting three tennis balls in a plastic cylinder package, and they're putting a cap on it, and then they're putting it in boxes. Okay, so in that department, in the packaging department, guess what? More direct materials, the package. More direct labor, the employees putting the balls in the package. More factory overhead. So, and that gets added to the cost I've already accrued in the previous departments. So I already had 80, I'm up to 80 cents in the felt department. So now I'm going to add another 10 cents of packaging, direct material says, so I'm up to 90 now, plus another 10 cents in labor, I'm up to a dollar, plus another 10 cents in factory overhead, dollar 10. So a dollar and 10 cents is my finished goods cost per sleeve of tennis balls. And I take that dollar ten and I move it in the finished goods. One's all packaged. Does that make sense? Does that flow make sense to everyone? Yes, it does. Awesome. Thank yes, you. Yes, it does. Great. Thank you so much. It's the flow. But we see the big difference. The big difference. I mean, there's a couple of big, big, big differences, right? Job order costing is based off of the customer order. Very specific, very individualized. Process costing, it's continuous. I'm going to keep making those tennis balls. Guess what? They're going to keep flying down that assembly line, that, that, uh, that conveyor belt. They're cruising, okay? And there's a lot of them. So there's no specific job here. There's just a ton of tennis balls, and it's a continuous thing, and people are on the assembly line doing all this, and, you know, the tennis balls are flying down that conveyor belt. That's continuous, you know? And as it's moving through the process, the big difference here between the two is within work and process, in the process cost system, I have multiple departments, because it's moving down that conveyor belt. Department 1, Department 2, Department 3. And then it becomes a finished good. Whereas work and order system, 
It's just work in process. But that's the primary difference between the two. Let's talk about how we transfer the cost from each department. Now, it starts off as raw materials, we know that. And I transfer the raw materials into the first work in process department. Okay. Once my first work in process department, this is where the employees are making the, they're forming the rubber into a, a ball shape. Yeah. Forming the core, as they say. That's why it's the core department. Once they're done doing that, the core rolls down the conveyor belt to the felt department. I have to transfer that inventory, the core, to the next department. I do that through a journal entry, an adjusting journal entry. So the first journal entry I make is I debit work in process inventory felt department and I credit work in process inventory core department. What that is doing is it's I'm um, taking it out of the core department. I'm putting it into the next department, which is the felt department. So that transaction represents the inventory being transferred to the next department. Now it moves down to that department. Okay, Now I'm in the felt department, the second department. Now I'm in the felt department. The machine is putting on the felt cover onto the core. I'm adding some more materials, labor, and factory overhead in this department. So I'm adding all that up. I'll show you what that looks like next. In this second department, when I'm done putting on the felt on the core, i got to move it into packaging. To do that, I debit work in process inventory packaging department. And I credit work in process inventory felt department. That transaction moves it out of the felt department and into the packaging department. So now the tennis ball rolling on down into the packaging department. And now, of course, I got to put the balls in the packages. So I got my sleeve, the more raw materials. I got my employees, direct labor. I got my overhead, and I'm adding all that to the previous uh, accrual. And now I'm finishing the packaging process. And I'm going to move it out of work in process and into finished goods. It's going to be heading on over to the warehouse. So I debit finished goods inventory and I credit work in process inventory packaging department. That's taking it out of work in process packaging and into finished goods. Because now it's done. It's, it's hanging out in the warehouse, ready to be going wherever it's going. Make sense so far? Y'all good, yeah? All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tinsley. Thank you. Yes, it's making sense. Thank you, Ms. Rhodes. All right. Okay. I'm going to show you the cost in the process costing system. I'm going to show you how it moves through each department within work in process 
To do that, we use what's called equivalent units of production. This is a challenging concept for most students. This, so this is going to be a very important part to pay attention to. Because I promise this is very challenging for most students. Remember that at each department, I have direct labor, direct materials, factory overhead, that I'm adding to the product at each department. Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, plus. Then it moves down the, down the chain. Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, plus. Moves down the chain. Direct materials, factory labor, that... <laughs> Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, and then it becomes a finished good. I'm adding to the cost at each department. So let me explain that to you uh, through this concept called equivalent units of production. Equivalent units of production is the number of units that could have been started and completed during the accounting period given the costs incurred during the accounting period. Remember, an accounting period could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a year. Right? So I will explain this mathematically. The equivalent units of production represents the units started and completed, in this example, 10,000 units, during the accounting period given the costs incurred. Okay. So I started and completed 10,000 units. 10,000 units at 100% complete direct materials used is 10,000 units. 10,000 times 100% is 10,000. <laughs> yeah. Think of it 10,000 times 1, right? Remember to convert your, your percentage to a decimal. Or, uh, yeah, to a decimal. 100% is 1, yeah? So 10,000 times 1 is 10,000. The equivalent units of production... For direct labor applied to those 10,000 units is 20%. In other words, my total cost of completing 100% of the units is 20%, which is direct labor. So if 20% is direct labor, I completed 10,000 units. 10,000 units times 20% is 2,000. 10,000 times point. Two, 2,000. The equivalent units of production for factory overhead is also 20% of 100% 100 completed units. So 10,000 times 20%, again, 2,000. 10,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 is 14,000 for total. I'll show you what all that looks like uh, in the next few slides. I'm going to go back to a, a uh, something we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, or maybe it was covered in 201, I don't remember. But it was probably 201, actually. Do you, do you remember... Uh, back in uh, Principles of Accounting 1, when we talked about the concepts of first in, first out, last in, first out, and weighted average, do you remember the, that? It was a while ago, I know. But do you I know that? I remember it. <laughs> I know Mark remembers yeah, I remember it. it too. Yeah. yeah, I know Miss Rhodes remembers it too. I remember that too. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago. But I want you to try to recall some of those concepts, okay? So remember, um, first in, first out 
this is where I'm going. Now I'm going back now. A couple of weeks back to principles of accounting one. First in, first out means that the first uh, order, the first purchase of inventory was the first one sold. Right? First in, first out. Last in, first out was the last purchase of inventory was the first one sold. Last in, first out. And then we had this one called weighted average, where I added up all of my inventory purchases, and I divided that by the number of purchases to get the weighted average, right? That was the basic concept, and that, that was how we allocated how much my inventory is worth. So, in process manufacturing, we use the weighted average approach to find the cost of our inventory. Now, using the weighted average approach, we go through four steps, okay? The first step is to understand the physical flow of units. Now remember, we're applying it to process costing. So here's what I want you to understand. The physical flow of units goes down the, the, the conveyor belt, right? I have multiple departments in my work in process. I have uh, the core department. I have the felt department. I have the packaging department. These are my individual departments as the tennis ball is flowing through. Okay, That is the physical flow of the unit. It started off as raw materials, went into work in process, started it as a core, core piece of rubber. They molded the core piece of rubber, yep. Then it went to the felt department down the conveyor belt. And then the felt got applied to the tennis ball. And then it went down the conveyor belt. And I went to the packaging department, got put uh, into a plastic sleeve, three tennis balls, put a cap on it, put it in a box, get it out of here. That's the physical flow of the units. So step one, figure out the physical flow of the units. The second step, is to compute the equivalent units of production. Equivalent units of production. So I'm going to go back. Sorry, wrong way. I'm going to go back to my conversion cost. Equivalent units of production. The number of units that could have been started and completed during the accounting period given the costs incurred during that accounting period. Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead incurred during the accounting period based on the number of units that I have started and completed during that period. That is the equivalent units of production. Once I find that, that's the second step. The third step is to compute the cost per equivalent unit. I'm going to go back one more time. Okay, This time I'm going to stop at this one. The conversion cost. Cost per equivalent unit. The reason I show you this is because I'm, we're going to get in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Okay. And then the fourth step of the process is to assign and reconcile costs. 
show you what that looks like. Don't worry. But these are the four steps that we follow using the weighted average cost for inventory within continuous process costing. First step, identify the physical flow. That's why I'm showing you a warehouse diagram. Okay, This warehouse diagram shows the physical flow of those tennis balls. Okay, uh, We can see that I got a lot going on in this warehouse. I got a storeroom, a front entrance, employee entrance, I have um, my, my various departments on the work in process. And then I got the, the loading dock. They're being shipped out. Yeah. So, so raw materials comes in on the left side, left, left top corner of, of my, uh, my operation here. Left, my raw materials come in from my purchases that I made for my raw materials, right? And they're stored in what we call a storeroom. They're waiting, waiting there be distributed when they're requisitioned. You probably remember that term from last week. My work in process first department will requisition, request raw materials when they're ready to start the process. Uh, I have my office support staff, HR, accounting, um, sales, that's my support staff, yeah? They all hang out there in this, in this uh, office here in the middle, near the front entrance. For the bottom left, it's where my employees come into work. They punch the employee time clock. Yeah, they clock in. They clock out for lunch. They clock back in. They clock out to go home. That's one of the ways I track the direct labor. In the center of my operation, I have the physical flow of my products through the work in process departments. Start in this example, I, I don't know, it's probably like um, chocolates or something. I'm going to say it's chocolates. I got chocolate on the mind. Okay, so it starts in the roasting department. It goes through down the conveyor belt to this whatever the, the heck these guys are doing. And then it flows up here to some type of other funneling machine. And then it goes into a blending department. And then it goes into packaging department. And then it flows on out as a finished good. It gets, and then it hangs out here in this warehouse on the far right as a finished good it's stored there and waiting to be shipped out it's a continuous flow but step one identify the physical flow of the units okay Step two, find the equivalent units of production, or compute equivalent units of production, sorry. In order to compute the equivalent units of production, we need to identify what we have in inventory at each stage. In this uh, top part of this slide, we have the beginning work and process inventory. Okay, this is the first department. At the end of March, at the end of March, I have beginning work and process inventory. It's just kind of chilling there in that first apartment. End of March, 30,000 units. Plus, 
The unit started during this accounting period. Month of April is this accounting period. So I, I started April 30,000 units plus I started an additional 90,000 units during the month of April. That gives me a total of 120,000 units that I started during the month of April. Okay? Then, I need to find the ending work in process inventory at the end of April. So I found out what I started. I got to find out what I completed. So I take my 120,000 that I started during the month of April. Minus units completed and transferred to finished goods. During the month of April was 100,000. So 120,000 started in April minus the units completed and transferred during the month of April, 100,000. 120 minus 100 is 20, 20,000. So my ending work in process inventory at the end of April is a 20,000. Just 20,000. We can see from that formula that the total units accounted for that have been started in the month of April is 120,000 equals the total units accounted for during the month of April, 120,000. Now, I need to find my conversion cost. I take the percentage of completion and factor the percentage of conversion. Now, here's the word conversion. A conversion cost simply means that I'm converting a unit of inventory from one department to another. Converting it. I'm moving it. Converting it. I'm moving it. Conversion cost simply means that I'm converting it toward becoming a finished good. Converting it. Yep. That's what conversion cost means. For direct materials, it's 100% all the way through. Converting 100% of my direct materials. 65% of direct materials was converted at the beginning of April. 65% of my direct materials was converted at the beginning of April. In other words, I started the month of April with 65% of my work in process already completed. 65%. At the end of April, or when the units were completed and transferred out, it was 100%. At the very end of April, I had 20,000 units remaining in inventory, work in process, which means that I had ended the month of April with 25% already completed. Conversion costs, I'm converting it from work in process to finish in, uh, completed goods. Toward the bottom here, we have what's called a production cost data sheet. Remember, this is managerial accounting. Principles of Accounting 2 is managerial accounting. We focus on financial reports that are internal to the company. 
internal data, okay? One of those types of reports is called the production cost data sheet. Basically, it shows me all my production costs. So I take my, and uh, this, is how, this is how it works. At the beginning of the month, or end of the previous month, March 31, I take my direct materials costs plus my conversion costs to get my beginning work in process. During the month of April, I take my direct materials cost plus my direct labor cost plus my factory overhead applied equals my cost during the month of April. I add my beginning work in process inventory cost to my costs incurred during the month of April to get my total production costs. Make sense so far? Conversion costs are probably the most complex for this uh, discussion. We're good so far. Yes, maybe, no. Yes, we did, Professor. You all still awake, yeah? <laughs> yeah, we're still awake. We were, right. I was right. reading your PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Just, just check on you all. You know, I know sometimes it gets a little, a little dull, you know. Okay, so let's review the steps. Step one, determine the physical flow of units. I started the work in process with 30,000 units. I started uh, during the month of April another 90,000 units. 30 plus 90 is 120. I'm accounted for 100,000 units completed and transferred out during the month of April. Plus the ending work in process inventory, 20,000 units to equal the total units accounted for. 120 equals 120. Counting equation is still in balance. Step two. Step two. Finding the equivalent units of production. Equivalent units of production formula is the number of whole units completed and transferred out to the next department plus the number of equivalent units in ending work and process inventory. That's the formula that you'll use for computing the equivalent units of production. So let's walk through it again, just so everyone's totally clear on equivalent units of production, because, again, very complex subject. Number of whole units completed and transferred out to the next department. 100,000 units. 100,000 units. 100,000 units times 100%. 100,000. So that first part of the formula is 100,000. We got that. Plus, number of equivalent units in ending work and process inventory. Our ending work and process inventory consisted of direct materials and conversion costs. I had 20,000 units remaining in ending work and process inventory. So I need to add my direct materials ending work and process inventory plus my conversion costs to get to 25,000 equivalent units of production. 
20,000 comes from direct materials. It's 20,000 units times 100%. Plus my conversion costs, 20,000 units at 25% conversion cost percentage, 25,000. The third step of the process is to compute the equivalent cost per unit, per unit. To do this, we take our cost of beginning work in process inventory plus costs incurred during the accounting period, in this example, the month of April, equals the total cost. We do that for direct materials and for conversion costs. Then, we take the equivalent units of production that we found from step two, the one we just did, and we divide the total cost. 360000 divided by 120000 is $3 per equivalent unit of production. I do the same thing for my conversion cost. 485,100 divided by 105,000 gives me $4.62 per equivalent unit of production. The fourth step is to assign and reconcile the cost. The cost of units completed and transferred to the next department we take the direct materials 100,000 equivalent units of production times three dollars per equivalent unit of production gets us 300,000 so 300,000 worth of direct materials for the month plus our conversion costs our conversion costs were 100,000 units times $4.62 per equivalent unit of production in conversion costs. So I add my 462 plus my 300 to get a cost of units completed during the month of April, 762,000. Now, of course, I need to find my ending work in process inventory. Ending work in process inventory, I have direct materials of 20,000 equivalent units of production times the $3 of equivalent unit of production. 20,000 times 3, 60,000. Plus conversion costs, 5,000 units of production times $4.62 of conversion cost per unit, $23,100. Which gives, add that to the 60, get $83,100. I take my cost of units completed during the period, $762,000, plus the, co the cost of ending work and process inventory, $83,100, to get the total cost accounted for. 845,100. That's just for the month of April. Now, since we, this is a managerial accounting course, we produce internal financial statements. These financial statements are internal to the company so we can make financial decisions. One of those is called the process cost summary. The process cost summary is simply a summary of costs throughout that month related to production, of course. And we can see that we have direct materials plus conversion costs, direct materials plus conversion costs for each department. Give us the summary of total cost accounted for. 
So as long as you follow those four steps, I promise you'll be all right. First, find the equivalent units of production. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the physical flow. Second, find the equivalent units of production. Third, find the cost per equivalent unit. And fourth, find the cost assignment and reconciliation. And this gives us a total process cost summary sheet. Sip of coffee. Throat's getting a little dry. Okay. <clears throat> at the end of April, at the end of each month, and looking at that, uh, in order to prepare a process cost summary sheet using the weighted average, we take a look at our costs. We've got raw materials inventory, beginning balance, yeah? we got work in process for Department 1, work in process for Department 2. I add those two together to find how much materials I've purchased. Uh, and then I need to find the amount of materials I used during the month of April requisitioned for each department, plus any indirect materials I may have used. I also need to find out the direct labor and factory overhead for each department. So we look at the labor used during the month of April for Department 1 and for Department 2, and of course any indirect labor. Remember, indirect labor is a supervisor's salaries, uh, uh, the people that are indirectly involved. Yeah? And, of course, the factory overhead. Insurance expense, utilities, depreciation, any other overhead. Yeah. So I find all my costs. Gather, I gathered all my costs. Then I record the flow of those costs and process costs. Take a look at materials. Materials flows through the process. Remember, it's continuous. That's what process costing is. It started off as raw materials inventory. I had it sitting, uh, you know, ready to be used. So I acquire raw materials for use. I debit raw materials inventory to increase raw materials inventory, and I credit accounts payable. I bought it on account. Okay. I didn't use cash. I bought it on account. The second transaction is we need to use the raw materials <laughs> in each department. It flows through. It flows through. So I debit work in process inventory Department 1. I debit work in process inventory, Department 2. And I credit raw materials inventory. This represents the raw materials being used in the work in process departments. It's like, this is like a, an adjusting journal entry I would do at the end of the month. The final transaction we see here is factory overhead. We got to apply factory overhead to uh, our costs. So I debit factory overhead, credit raw materials inventory. So that's materials. What about labor? Oh, labor, there's always labor. So, of course, each department, I have employees. So I debit the inventory for each department, and I credit factory wages payable. I debit the wages, uh, I'm sorry, I debit work and process inventory for each department to increase the value of that inventory. Because remember, 
The cost of manufacturing is direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. So I add in direct materials, which I just did. Now I'm adding in direct labor, and then I'll do factory overhead. I'm adding it in for, for each department. So debit, work and process inventory, debit, work and process inventory for each department. Credit, factory, wages payable. And of course, I have a little factory overhead wages I got to factor in. So debit, factory overhead, credit, factory wages payable. That's my indirect labor. You know, the manager, the whoever else. And then I got to pay my employees. <laughs> so debit, factory wages payable. Credit cash. So we did direct materials. We did direct labor. Now you know we got to do factory overhead. Factory overhead involves the various costs associated with running the factory that is indirect to the manufacturing process, but we still have to account for it. So I do that with what we call a general journal entry. I debit factory overhead, and I credit things like prepaid insurance, utilities payable, uh, I don't know why cash is on there, accumulated depreciation. And I apply that factory overhead to work in process. Because remember, work the, the cost of manufacturing involves direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Factory overhead, in this case, this is a uh, single wide plant wide rate, rate method of overhead of 120% of direct labor cost. It's predetermined factory overhead. Factory overhead rate, predetermined. We talked about that in the past few chapters. So our debit work and process inventory for the Department 1, debit work and process inventory for Department 2, credit factory overhead. What that's doing is applying the cost of factory overhead to production. Now I'm going to show you how the transfers work. Remember we talked about transferring out, right? We're transferring it out of work and process inventory to finished goods inventory. And then when it gets sold, it becomes cost of goods sold. So I got to get it from one department to another department, and then from that department to finished goods. And then from finished goods to cost of goods sold. So the first transaction represents the inventory being transferred to the next department. Remember, in process costing, we have multiple departments within work and process. So this first transaction represents the transfer of inventory from department one to department two. Debit work and process inventory department one. Credit work and process inventory. I'm sorry. Debit work and process in inventory department two. Credit work and process inventory department one. That shows it coming from out of department one and into department two as it's going down the conveyor belt. Remember, follow the physical flow of the inventory. The second transaction here, 9B, is we're taking the inventory out of work and process and putting it into finished goods. So debit, finished goods inventory, credit, work and process inventory of the second department. And then, of course, we're going to sell it. Sitting in the warehouse, time to sell it. Debit, cost of goods sold on the income statement. Credit, finished goods inventory. Balance sheet.
that's the physical flow. That's that's how that's how process costing works. A very general sense of process costing and how it works. We what we did is we track the uh, physical flow of the inventory, and we associated the cost at each stage as it went through that process. A couple of trends uh, happening in work and process operations. I'm going to uh, talk about a few of these. Customer orientation. We, in manufacturing, we try to design our products around the customer's needs. Uh, these companies are providing services to our customers uh, based on their needs. The design process of the products being manufactured around the customer's needs. Uh, it's continuous. Just like in, in the earlier example I gave with the tennis balls, it's a continuous manufacturing process. It never stops. That conveyor belt's going to keep going and going and going. I'm going to have employees coming in and out for various shifts. The, the morning shift, the afternoon shift, the evening shift, the overnight shift. Right? It's continuous. Yeah? It runs 24-7. We're using a lot more robotics and automation in the manufacturing process. What that does is it helps to it helps the humans in the manufacturing process to be able to manufacture more of them. It creates what we call a larger yield. The word yield means how much more I'm able to manufacture because I'm being more efficient. And that leads us to this thing called just-in-time production. Just-in-time production simply means that I'm producing as I need it. It's just in time. That's how we have lean operations. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, there are some instances where we could have a combination of of both job order costing and process order cost, process costing, job order costing and process costing. Once in a great while, you'll come across a company that does both, a little bit of both. It's called a hybrid system. Okay, and then that hybrid system. We are continuously manufacturing through process costing, but we might also have a couple of special requests. Like go, go back to the ice cream example I gave earlier on. The Ben and Jerry's, right? So think of the Ben and Jerry's. The Ben and Jerry's, they're really good at making vanilla, uh, Rocky Road, a couple of other like great flavors, right? But well, once in a while, they'll come out with this special edition of uh, Ben & Jerry's. They're going to do it in a batch. Yeah, they're only going to make so much of it. That's where the hybrid comes in. So hybrid, hybrid combines a little bit of both process and job order costing. It requires the system to determine cost of products and services. The companies try to standardize process while meeting the customer's needs, and it's important to monitor and control costs. Going back to that example, the Ben & Jerry's thing, it's a, like once in a while, a company will come out with like the, the 75th anniversary edition or the, oh, the special whatever special, okay? What that means is it's it's a limited time uh, production of that ice cream for a certain amount of time. And then when it's gone, it's gone. We're not going to make any more of it. So that, that combines my process costing, which I'm continuously making certain flavors of ice cream, and then I have the one-offs. The one-offs, that, that means like a specialized run of just that one flavor for a short amount of time. And then when I'm done manufacturing it, it, it gets out right away and sold, and I'm not going to make any more of it. Yep. 
That's that's how that's my example of combining the, the both job order costing and process costing. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens every so often. First in, first out. Some companies track the production pr uh, process costing using the first in, first out method. As you recall, the first in, first out method tracks the first cost of the purchase of inventory as being the cost that is first to go out. So, let's take a look at the same production data. Uh, beginning uh, work in process. So, end of March. So, looking at April data, yeah. I got 30,000 units of product. 100% percent percent complete for direct materials. Uh for conversion costs, I'm looking at 65%. So my direct materials costs 81,000. My conversion costs 108,900. During the month of April, I started the month of April with 90,000 units. I transferred out 100,000. My direct materials costs were 279,000. My direct labor cost was 171,000. My factory overhead costs applied 120% of labor, 205200 My ending work in process for the month of April was 20,000 units, 100,000 direct materials, uh, I'm sorry, 100% direct materials, and conversion costs were 25%. First step, determine the physical flow of units. Okay. Uh, beginning work in process, 30,000 plus units started in the period 90,000. That's 120. I reconcile that with uh, units completed and transferred out during the month of April, 100,000. Plus ending work in process inventory, 20,000. That's 120. Oh, and of course, I'm sorry, to, com to find the total com uh, units transferred out during the month, we take the beginning inventory plus uh, the units we started during the month of April. The second step, compute the equivalent units of production. Equivalent units of production. Sorry. Uh, so we we have equivalent units to complete beginning in beginning work in process. We don't have any. But we got zero. Conversion costs thirty five percent. So we start the month with ten thousand five hundred equivalent units of production for conversion costs. We had said that we started during the month of April 70,000 units and completed, sorry, started and completed uh, 70,000 units. So it's the same for direct materials and conversion. Step C, or part C, is we take the direct materials, 20,000 units at 100% is 20,000. And we have conversion costs, 20,000 units, 25% conversion cost rate is 5,000 equivalent units of production for conversion. I add up all my direct materials, 70,000 plus 20,000 is 90. I add up all my conversion costs, 10,500 plus 70,000 plus 5,000 is 85,500. The third step is to find the equivalent uh, cost per unit. Direct materials was 279000 Costs incurred during the period. Divided by the equivalent units of production, 90000 
So 279 divided by 90 is $3.10 per unit for direct materials. My conversion cost per unit is 376,200 divided by the 85,800 units is $4.40. And of course, step four is to assign and reconcile those, co those costs. Bidding working process plus conversion costs at the beginning plus direct materials and, and conversion costs completed at, started and completed during the period plus direct materials and conversion costs at the end of the accounting period equals the total cost accounted for. This is just a nice uh, short version uh, for, for work in process. Direct materials plus conversion plus direct materials plus conversion during the period gets me my total cost account. Comments, questions, concerns. No. I guess it's pretty much understandable. Like I said, you break it down to make it more understandable. I try to, you know, the, the, especially these difficult topics like conversion costs. It's hard. It's hard. You know, th this is probably, yeah. you know, honestly, in my opinion, conversion costs is probably the hardest um, concept in managerial accounting. Yeah, yeah. It does get a little bit confusing, but like I said, you break it down. Because in the way, before, when I read your PowerPoint ahead, and I did the um, the exercises, and then I did the little the little quiz thing, uh -huh. it helped a lot. It helped a lot because it, it is you can go back and look where you made your mistake. You know, because the first one I didn't do too good, but I went back and I looked uh, in the places where I made my mistakes. So yeah, got a better grade. I'm I'm glad that you did that. Yeah, that, and that's that's a that's a good move to make. So uh, I'm I'm glad that you said that too, Mr. Rhodes, because uh, hopefully your colleagues, are, your classmates are are listening to what you just said because I find it very important that you go through the exercises, go through the presentation again, read carefully, uh, try some of the exercises from the book. Try the exercises in the classroom, and then do the homework. Because again, it's all about the practice and applying what you're learning, and that will help you to better understand and to better um, remember the concepts. Thank you for sharing that. Are there any other comments, questions, or concerns on what we just covered? about process costing. Y'all good. I want to um, just quickly bring you back into the classroom and I want to show you uh, where we are. Just to recap, okay? And, uh, and by the way, you're all doing very well in class. Uh, I sincerely appreciate all the hard work you're all putting into this because I know it's not easy. The accounting is probably the most difficult subject in business, okay? I know that. Uh, a, a lot of people know that. That's why people get accountants, right? But um, the effort that you're putting in, it shows. You know, it shows that you're all working very hard. So I appreciate that. And I want, I want you to know that I appreciate what you're doing. It's meaningful to me and to you. It's meaningful. So, uh, in the classroom, I uh, want to quickly recap where we are, where we're going. Come on through, come on down. We uh, wrapped up the first module, the first four weeks. They're done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of you are doing your work on time, and I really appreciate that as well. We're now in the second module, so click on module two, week five. PowerPoint's there. The exercises are there. By this Sunday night, I would like you to please complete the Chapter 20 quiz. 
it's the same as before. It's about five questions, multiple choice, uh, uh, true, false, all that jazz. Um, go through carefully. Take your time with it. I, w- I would like you to do the quiz after you've reread the chapter, gone through the exercises, practice a little bit, then take the quiz. If you don't do well on the quiz, it's okay. Remember, you have two attempts on every homework assignment and every quiz. So if you're not happy with the grade you get on the chapter 20 quiz, take it again. It's all right. You know, I'll accept the higher of the two attempts in the grade book. That goes for all quizzes and all homework assignments in this course. The only thing you can't do twice is the midterm or the final. You know, it's, I can't allow that part. I'm sure you wish I could, but I can't. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. With that, as always, if you ever have any trouble, you ever uh, have any questions about the work that you're doing, please email me, call me, set up office hours. We also have tutoring available in this course. So if you know you don't feel comfortable with me for whatever reason, hopefully you do. But if you don't, we have tutoring as well. So take advantage of what we have available to you. Um, uh, again, I'm here for you. As always, uh, I want you to please stay safe. Wash your hands. You know, you got the whole virus thing. Wash your hands. Do the right things. And I'll see you all again, same time next week, 11 a.m., Monday, uh, wait, Tuesday, sorry. I'll see you Tuesday morning, 11 a.m. Have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead. Uh, Enjoy the uh, happy Valentine's Day to all of you this weekend. Um, And uh, enjoy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.